In our last episode, we worked our way through Tier 9 of the Complete Video Game Console Iceberg, and now we've finally made it to the bottom. These consoles are the rarest and most obscure on the list. Even finding pictures of some of these consoles was next to impossible, but I'm determined to bring you at least a brief history of every single video game console ever made. So let's just get right into it and take a deep dive into Tier 10, starting with one from Nintendo that you probably didn't even know existed. The iQ Player is a home video game console released in 2003 by iQ in a partnership with Nintendo. It sold for 499 Chinese won, which is about 120 US dollars today, converted and adjusted for inflation. In China, it's called Shen Yu Ji, which translates to Divine Gaming Machine. This console was never released in English speaking countries, but the name iQ Player is visible in the instruction manual. China has a large black market for video games, and usually only a few consoles officially make it to the Chinese market. Many Chinese gamers tend to purchase pirated cartridges or disc copies, or download copied game files and play them with an emulator. Nintendo wanted to stop software piracy in China and bypass the ban that the Chinese government had placed on home video game consoles since 2000. Basically, Nintendo was trying to deal with the clone console problem in China, so they came up with the genius idea of cloning their own console. The IQ player is constructed with the same logic as N64DD or Stellaview, where the games are stored on 64 megabyte flashcards. The 64 megabyte flashcard is contained within a cartridge that plugs directly into the console itself, which doubles as a controller. The controller features an analog thumbstick and a directional pad on the left side, a power and start button in the center, and six face buttons on the right side, which include the traditional Nintendo A and B buttons, as well as four directional buttons labeled C. This lesser known Nintendo console has 14 games, all of which were previously published by Nintendo in other countries. The list of classic game titles include Mario 64, F-Zero, Super Smash Bros., and Mario Kart 64. Games were purchased at a special IQ depot where the games could be downloaded onto the cartridges and played later. Although in contrast with N64, the IQ player uses system on a chip technology in order to reduce the size. There is no difference between the N64 version and the IQ version of these games except for the fact that text and in some cases voices have been translated to Chinese. However, being that the IQ games are newer than the N64 counterparts, many of the glitches and errors from the original games have been fixed. Some extra features with the IQ player include the option for parental controls by setting an age limit. Also, there's the possibility to set the console's real-time counter, which gives the option to put playtime limits on the system. All of those features are enabled by a four-digit password that can be enabled by the parent and would be required by the player to access the game menu each time the unit was turned on. After being produced for 13 years, the IQ was finally discontinued in 2016, having sold an estimated 12,000 consoles. The IQ at home service remained active for another two years until it was finally put offline in 2018 and the best selling game for the system was Dr. Mario. Our next console has a unique feature and that is actually two game systems built into one, aptly named it's the Dyna 2-in-1. The Dyna 2-in-1 is a video game console made by the Taiwanese company Bit Corporation and was released in 1986. It was later brought to the United States by the Telegames company and released as the Telegames Personal Arcade at a cost of only $40, which is just over $100 today. The Dyna 2-in-1 was unique in that it had two cartridge slots. One was made to accept cartridges from the original ColecoVision console, while the other was made to play Sega SG-1000 games. This hybrid system was possible due to the fact that the ColecoVision and Sega SG-1000 have nearly identical hardware. The two consoles share the same CPU, VDP, and sound chip. The controllers have very similar layout to the classic Nintendo controllers, featuring a directional pad and two face buttons. The console, however, is not compatible with all ColecoVision cartridges, partly from its lack of a secondary numeric keypad. Any ColecoVision game that requires two keypads can't be used. A difference in the Dyna's controller wiring prevents the use of Coleco's roller controller and super action controllers, and games dependent on either one aren't compatible. Expansion modules for the ColecoVision are also incompatible, as the expansion port uses the pin configuration of the Sega SG-1000, so ColecoVision games that rely on expansion modules also can't be used. The Dyna is, however, compatible with the SG-1000 keyboard. The Telegames Personal Arcade was only advertised as an alternative to the ColecoVision, leaving the function of the Sega SG-1000 cartridge port unmentioned in advertising due to fear of being sued for trademark and copyright infringement. After all, they didn't receive any permission to license this feature. Despite this legal loophole, all Sega SG-1000 games are completely functional. 
The console does not have a port for the Sega MyCard games, but the Sega Card Catcher peripheral is compatible and allows for Sega MyCard games to be played on the system. By the time the Dyna was released in 1986, the Nintendo Entertainment System, a system vastly superior to both the Sega SG-1000 and ColecoVision, had already been released in North America. The Dyna had very little appeal except for its low price point. The system was sold by mail order only, and little to no advertisement was done around the launch of the console. To keep the cost down, the box didn't even include the required 12 volt power supply, the RF selection box, or any instructions. The console worked on channel 13, which is counterintuitive in North America being that most systems ran on channel 3 or 4, especially when you don't have any instructions to figure that out. Another problem was the usefulness of the console. The ColecoVision was discontinued in 1985, but could still be purchased for less than the cost of the Dyna 2-in-1. And the Dyna wasn't fully compatible with all of its games, so there wasn't really any benefit to choosing the Dyna over the original ColecoVision. Then, since the SG-1000 compatibility was a hidden feature, the only advantage this system had over the ColecoVision wasn't even known to anyone who was considering buying it. In all fairness, even if the feature would have been marketed, it probably would have very little effect on sales, because it was almost impossible to buy Sega SG-1000 games in the US since they were never released in North America. Very few Dyna 2-in-1 consoles were sold and it was discontinued in 1994, mostly due to its mail order only marketing and the fact that a tornado ripped through the telegames factory, wiping out the warehouse and all of its remaining stock. The system is very rare and hard to find today. While the Dyna 2-in-1 wasn't officially licensed by Sega, the next console on the list was, and it was the Sega Family Driver. Sega! The Sega Family Driver, also called the Video Driver in North America, is a VHS-based video game system designed to play racing games. It was released in 1988 by the Sega Corporation in Japan at a cost of 8,800 yen, which is about 165 US dollars today converted and adjusted for inflation. The console is made of a steering wheel and a sensor that was attached to a television. On top of the sensor sits a plastic car that is controlled electronically by the steering wheel. The system uses VHS tapes instead of game cartridges. The objective of the game was to follow the course of the road to maximize your score. The scoreboard started from 100 points. If your plastic car drifted off the road and hit an obstacle, you'd see flashing lights, sound, and your score would drop by one point. The goal of the game was to finish the race with all 100 points. Only three games were released for the system in Japan. Halahara Touring 1 was included with the system, while Seaside Drive and I Am A Patrol were both sold separately for 1,900 yen. In North America, only two games were ever released. California Chase was the first game and it was bundled with the console. Road Race was later released alongside California Chase in a single VHS tape and became the new pack-in game for the system. In Europe, the same two games as North America were released but with slightly different names. California Chase was released as Police Pursuit and Road Race was changed to Road Racer. The games were sold separately and were not bundled on the same VHS tape as they were in North America. The Sega Video Driver didn't sell well at all. The games that were released provided a very linear and boring experience, which was limited by the capabilities of the VHS tapes. The Video Driver was very unpopular among gamers and was discontinued shortly after release with total sales numbers unknown. The next console on our list was designed with playing card games in mind and it's called the Champion 2711. The Champion 2711 is a video game console released by Unisonic in 1978 in the US at a cost of $150, which is about $680 today, adjusted for inflation. The console was also released in Japan the following year as a Unisonic Casino TV game. Like dozens of other manufacturers of consumer electronics, Unisonic released a series of dedicated consoles in the late 1970s. The consoles were generally built around Pong, a game console released by Atari in 1975 and Unisonic released its first version of the game in 1976 named the Unisonic Sportsman T101. In 1978, the company released its last Pong console, the Olympian 2600, which featured 10 games and substituted joysticks for the paddle controllers and light gun, before finally releasing the Champion 2711 later that year. The Champion 2711 is the only product known to be based on the Gemini mid-range 8950 chip designed by General Instruments. Like the Mattel Intellivision, which is based on the more powerful General Instruments Gemini Full Range 8900 chip, the Champion 2711 is built around the same 16-bit CPU, however the mid-range chipset makes use of a simple combined display and sound chip, which can only generate white text and colored playing card symbols on a green playing field. Because of this chip, the Unisonic Champion 2711 was limited to text and playing card graphics. 
The system output at a resolution of 213 by 132 in four colors of white, black, green, and red, and could only generate simple audio tones. The console contains two built-in games, Blackjack and Baccarat, and four more cartridges were released for the system. Three of these cartridges contain additional card games, including variations of Poker, Mastermind, and Concentration. The fourth cartridge is an edutainment title called Arithmetic Primer. This system represents a transitional time in the development of video game consoles and shows the struggles of attempting to transition from production of dedicated Pong consoles to early cartridge-based systems. As a consequence of its commercial failure and limited production run, the Champion 2711 is now very rare. It's estimated that only around 500 consoles were ever produced and collectors have only been able to confirm the existence of 13 of them to this day. So while being considered one of the worst consoles ever made, due to its rarity, they are very valuable today. Moving on to what might be one of the most family-friendly video game consoles ever made, let's talk about the Zappit Game Wave. The Game Wave Family Entertainment System, commonly abbreviated as Game Wave, is a hybrid DVD player and home video game console manufactured by Zappit Games. It was first released in 2005 in Canada and the US at a cost of $99, which is about $150 today adjusted for inflation. The console itself is little more than a standard progressive scan DVD player. Half of the console, and part that makes up the Wave in the name Game Wave, is just a covered storage unit for the controllers. The console was originally packed with the game Four Degrees, The Arc of Trivia, and was later replaced with VeggieTales Veg Out. Because of the use of family-friendly games and a partnership with VeggieTales, the system found some success with Christian households. The controller has four directional buttons used for menu navigation and DVD playback controls. It has four alphanumeric buttons along the top labeled A, B, C, and D, designed primarily for selecting responses in trivia games. A numeric pad is also at the bottom of the controller with a menu and setup buttons. The controller came in six colors. Blue, yellow, green, and red came packaged with the console, and purple and orange controllers could be purchased separately for $30. Each controller color has a different infrared frequency, allowing the console to tell different controllers apart from each other for multiplayer games. Due to the shape of the controller and its marketing as a family-friendly entertainment system, no heavily action-based games were ever made for the console's 13-game library. Instead, games consisting mainly of trivia games and puzzle games were produced. Unfortunately, even with its family-friendly marketing, the Game Wave didn't generate enough interest in the Christian community to be financially viable. In a last-ditch effort, Zappit did relaunch the console and reduce the price from $100 to $80, but it was too little too late. By 2009, the company had invested $25 million in the Game Wave project and was out of cash and was forced to declare bankruptcy. An estimated 70,000 Game Wave consoles were produced in its four-year lifespan. A company that's no stranger to the iceberg is VTEC, and the next console on the list is called the V-Flash. The VTEC V-Flash, known as V-Smile Pro in Europe, is a 7th generation 32-bit console released in 2006. The system retailed for $100, which is about $150 today adjusted for inflation. The V-Flash is a successor to the V-Smile systems and aimed at children from the ages of 6 to 10. This console is the most powerful and advanced VTech console ever made, capable of playing games with 3D graphics similar to the Sega Saturn. But since it didn't sell too well, not many games were ever produced for it. The console itself has a gray and blue color scheme and a front panel with a curvy style to it that somewhat resembles a small DVD player or set-top DVR box. On top of the unit, the right side has a pop-open door that provides access to the CD disk drive. In Europe, the V-Smile Pro had a clear orange piece on the tray and had orange feet. The controller is similar to traditional gamepad controllers found on earlier systems, having a directional pad, start button, and four face buttons. There are only 10 game titles known to have been made for the system, all of which are licensed from popular franchises. Some of its games include SpongeBob SquarePants, Scooby-Doo, Disney Princess, Spider-Man, and Cars. Unlike most other CD-ROM based consoles, this system uses CDs enclosed in a plastic case to protect the discs from being damaged by children. But being that the discs use the ISO 9660 file system without any copy protection, you can play pirated games with an empty disc caddy that actually came with the system to play audio CDs. Or you can just trick the console into playing a regular CD by pressing the button in the disc tray, which would normally be pressed by having a V-Disc inside the console. 
Overall, the console was a commercial failure, primarily due to the fact that although its games were marketed towards young children, they found the 3D gameplay hard to adapt to, and older children weren't interested in playing the small library of childish games. So after being on the market for less than two years, the V Flash was discontinued in 2007. Now back to the list for another console, this time from Germany, it's the SHG Blackpoint. The SHG Blackpoint, also known simply as the Blackpoint, is a second generation video game console that was released in 1982 by this company which I won't even attempt to pronounce the name of, which is simply known as SHG for short. It was released only in Germany at a cost of 168 Deutschmarks, which was about 75 US dollars at the time or about $230 today converted and adjusted for inflation. The system came with two detachable game controllers, each having one analog joystick and one fire button. On the console, there were 10 buttons to select game modes, and games came on ROM cartridges. There's also a difficulty switch, an on-off switch, and a start button on the console itself. There were two models of the system produced, the FS1003 and the FS2000, and the console itself did not contain any CPU or RAM, and instead they were built into the cartridges themselves. There were only 7 or 8 games officially known to have been released for the system, which include a shooting game, a naval war simulator, and racing games. There was also a tank battle game that came with two digital controllers that were required to play. The games were sold for around 50 to 80 Deutschmarks, which was about 20 to 30 dollars each. Like the Palladium Telecassette game and many other second generation consoles, the SHG Blackpoint uses PC50X cartridges. The cartridges are also compatible with the AudioSonic programmable video system and the Hanamex HMG1292 home video game console we talked about in earlier tiers. While this console was primarily only sold in Germany, they were made in fairly large quantities. So while total sales numbers are unknown, they can still be found pretty easily all over Europe to this day. Another game system very similar to the Blackpoint but made a few years earlier is the Palladium Telecassette Game. The Palladium Telecassette Game is a home video game console that was released in 1978 only in Germany. Palladium is the subdivision of the mail order company Neckermann Technologies in Germany and the console sold for $99 which is about $450 today adjusted for inflation. The console features a black housing with 10 selection switches on it, making it possible to choose between up to 10 different game modes for various games. There were also three buttons on the console to change game options, and there are two different versions of the console known to exist, the 530 and the 581. The controllers of the 581 model have fire buttons which are different than the controller of the 530 model. There were many Pong style predecessors of the Palladium Telecassette game known to exist, so here's a brief list of some of them. Like the SHG Blackpoint and many other European consoles around the late 1970s and early 1980s, the Palladium Telecassette game uses PC50X ROM cartridges. The console itself didn't contain a CPU as it was built into the game cartridges themselves. There were four games included in the system, Auto Race, Tele Bowling, 10 Ball Games, and Motorcycle Race. There were also seven cartridge games released, and they are all classic games built on General Instruments chips, like Cycling, Motorcycle Race, Car Racing, Submarine, and Super Wipeout. These of course are the generic English titles, the real names being in German. Like the SHG Blackpoint, there was also a tank battle cartridge sold that required digital controllers as opposed to the analog joystick controllers that came with the system. In 1982, a successor, the Palladium Video Computer Game was released, and it's essentially the same system as the Emerson Arcadia 2001, and in fact both consoles are software compatible with each other, so they could technically play each other's games if the cartridge slots were the same, but they aren't. The video computer game came with two detachable controllers that featured a screw-on analog joystick and a 16-button keypad. Small plastic overlays were included with each game, explaining the functions of the different keys when placed over the keypads, just like with Mattel's and television. Due to the fact that there were so many different variations of the Palladium game consoles made, exact sales numbers are unknown, but being that they were produced in such large numbers, they can still be found quite easily all across Europe almost 50 years later. The next and final console on the list was manufactured with a very specific purpose in mind, and it's rightfully named the BBC Bridge Companion. The BBC Bridge Companion is exactly what you would think, a game console dedicated to teaching the card game bridge, and this is the only reason that this console was ever produced. It was released in 1985 exclusively in the UK by the British Broadcasting Company and sold for £199, which is about 800 US dollars today converted and adjusted for inflation. 
The console didn't have high sales numbers, but this was to be expected. The Bridge Companion's price was pretty high, and it was targeted at a very specific audience. So from that point of view, the console's release was considered a success. The system is powered by a Zlong Z88 bit CPU with a Texas Instruments video controller capable of displaying eight colors and simple beeps for audio. The console didn't have a controller and instead the buttons were directly on the unit itself since the system was made with the sole purpose of providing an easy way to play bridge electronically. At the system's launch, only one game cartridge was available while others were in the process of being developed. Gradually, a total of nine game cartridges were released, each providing an interactive tutorial on various aspects of the game of bridge. Players controlled the action with a gamepad that was integrated into the top of the system. The games were released in a clamshell style case with a large spiraled notebook for the instruction manual. And for some odd reason, the cartridge slot is located on the back of the system. Although not many consoles were ever sold, the system really didn't fail as it was never really expected to be sold in large quantities. It was aimed at a very limited subset of people and it did manage to deliver on the expectation of its customers. Being that they were sold in fairly limited numbers, they are a pretty rare system and can be hard to find today. The BBC Bridge Companion is a great little oddity in the history of video game consoles. And that's it, we made it to the bottom of the complete video game console iceberg. If you made it this far, I really do appreciate it, and if you took a second to click the like button, that would be amazing. Let me know in the comments if you had a chance to play any of these consoles, and which one of the over 100 systems on the list was your favorite. A lot of work went into this series, and I thank all of you for watching, liking, and leaving positive comments. I plan to release the entire thing as a 3.5 hour long documentary. I'll be releasing the draft next week, and I need your help to pick it apart and tell me any errors you can find so I can fix them in the final edit. You can follow me on all social media platforms at Iceberg Docs if you want to stay updated and connect with me. And you can now become a channel member on YouTube or a Patreon where you'll get benefits like discounts on merch, video shout outs, and early access to my docs before they release on YouTube. Again, I thank each and every one of you for your support and for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.